Hello and welcome to The Game Changers. I'm Sue Anstis and this is the podcast where you'll hear from trailblazing women in sport. A big thanks to Barclays for supporting this series of The Game Changers, which features fearless women in football. My guest today is Arsenal and England legend Rachel Yankee. I started our conversation by asking Rachel about her earliest memories of football. Go earliest, I suppose, going down the park with my my brother and um, his friends and my friends, and yeah, just joining in. There used to be, well, it isn't like it is today. I mean, we used to play like probably twenty a side. <laughs> it's just very dangerous. <laughs> um, so being, I don't even how how old I was. But just being very young and and sort of going down and joining in games of football and kicking a ball around and yeah, with probably a lot of people that were were a lot older than me. And boys and girls, a mixture of boys and girls or mainly boys. To, to be honest, they were probably all boys. When I was really young, it used to be my brother, uh, his friends from school, maybe their sisters. So maybe boys and girls there. But then when we when I went down the park with. Um, with the two boys that lived across the road from me, so probably about nine, eight or nine. We used to play, there's just hordes of people, um, you know, teenagers, and we just sort of, every, usually like most of my friends would have older brothers. Um, my brother, he, he, he liked watching football, but probably wasn't as active in football when he got older. It, it, it's not cool to hang around with your little sister, is it? So, um <laughs> So I think I, I used to go down there with with other people and, and join in with other people's older brothers. They just used to, I suppose, look after me, to protect and, and just let me play. I used to have great fun. I mean, we used to play football mostly, but I mean, there was old times that we played cricket and stuff like that. So yeah, just join in, get involved and yeah, it was good fun. And where did you live? Where did you grow up? Uh, I, grew, I grew up in uh, in Brent, in Queen's Park. I lived just down the road from the park. So, yeah, we used to go down there and, and just play loads of football. But also I used to go, when I went to uh, to secondary school, I used to go to, um, with a whole load of mates, to Wilson Sports Centre. And, yeah, we used to climb over the fences. <laughs> Not sure that's about <laughs> But uh, yeah, jump the fences and, and play football until, uh, until the security would see us. And then we'd all quickly grab the ball and run. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that was good fun. And how did your family feel? Were they supportive of your of your football when you were young? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, I grew up with my mum and my brother. My mum used to take us like swimming and, and football. And both me and my brother uh, used to run for Highgate Harriers. Oh, right. So he was quite good. He used to do like hurdles and stuff like that. Um, I used to do the 800 metres. I used to do the 800 too, yeah. I think it worked, most people, if they looked at me how I play football, they wouldn't have imagined me doing the 800 metres. Um, but I was quite good at it. And then uh, I got moved to do the 1500. And I think that was the point where I went, I don't want to run anymore. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so I think we we used to do quite a lot of sport, and I don't. I think my mum just obviously knew me as a person, and just a lots of people, especially in primary school, other parents sort of said, you know, why do you let her play football? And um, you know, you should concentrate on studies and education, and you know, football's not for girls. But I think one, my mum knew if she told me, I'd do the exact opposite. Uh, just probably my, most kids. But also she could see that there was a real, you know, the passion to it. I don't think she ever thought, oh, you're doing this to make a career out of it, because I don't think I thought that. But um, but you want your kids to be happy, don't you? So um, I think, you know, she knew that playing football, me going down the park and playing football, I mean, there was a lot of worse things that I could be getting involved in. So that, <laughs> that really was, you know what I mean? She knew I was down there. Good, that's really good. And uh, can you tell us... I guess what you had to do and do to play um, in a boys team, I know it's a story that's much told, but if you could tell that story. Yeah, like I said, I grew up with uh, the two boys that lived across the road, Michael and Lawrence, and they wanted to join a football team. And and one of the parents at their school started making a football team because his son wanted to play football. There was no clubs really around where we lived. He wasn't a football coach, but he was, you know, a keen football fan. So he decided to to start up a football team in the uh, South Kilburn estate. So Michael and Lawrence joined and they asked me if I wanted to join. So I was like, yeah, wicked, you know, like get to play for a football team. And then we sort of realised that 
before going there all all the people at school his school that were going to go were all boys so maybe it wasn't you know right for a girl to go I, I don't know how how close this was but uh but basically they went to get a haircut one day and I was with them uh we were sitting in the barbers and uh yeah the the barber sort of said next customer and, and looked at me <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know, maybe a little bit of peer pressure <laughs> from the barber. But yeah, I just, uh, I sat down and um, and said, can I have the same haircut as my friend? So <laughs> I don't know how, how long it was at that point. But um, yeah, he cut my hair off, same. I think it was probably a, about a grade two all over. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, yeah, my mum wasn't that impressed when I, when I walked in. I did wear a hat for quite a long time. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know, I just did it and then, I, I joined the um, I joined the football team. Uh, or I went down to train with them, and uh, Lawrence. Uh, I think it was Lawrence that came up with it to call me Ray. Uh, my initials spell out Ray, and um, and then everyone called me Ray. And I just think that it's quite easy to to fool people when they already think that that football is for boys and football is played by boys. And if you can play and the way the way I played, the way I moved, it was agile. It was you know I could, I could, I could play really well. I was as good as any of the boys. So I don't think if people had said, "Oh, that's a girl," people would have gone, "No." Nah. Do you know what I mean? There, there wasn't there wasn't a lot of convincing that needed. I had short hair. I think it was quite easy to convince people. I don't think a lot of people sort of questioned it. The manager knew. His name was Tony Chelsea. He knew that I was a girl. Um, he spoke to my mum. Said my mum was like, "Yeah, if she wants to go, I'm quite happy with her, her joining." And then um, he just called me Ray, and everyone called me Ray. And um, yeah, I went joined the team. The the team used to play in a um, a fibre side league at Kingsbury High School, which Tony Chelsea used to pick us up in his. He was a painter and decorator, so he used to pick us up in his van uh, and take us. It was just the most dangerous thing that I think of when, <laughs> when I look at it. You know, I don't know how many kids, five or six kids in the back of a white van, like <laughs> load of paint, loads of just being thrown around. <laughs> but what an opportunity that he created for you. Like you think you look back and think if he hadn't done that ahead of your career. Oh, yeah. You, I mean, to be honest, if he hadn't have done that, I probably wouldn't have joined a football team, let alone a girls football team. He'd done... He done so much for me, and when I was playing in in the boys' league, and and obviously I think I think we played in a cup final, and there was a boy on the other team that that knew me and and sort of said to the referee, you know, that there's a girl. Tony Chelsea told me, which I believed for years and years and years, that it was his mistake, and and he'd filled in my registration, and I was too old. But he told me because I got to to see him again because I hadn't seen him so long. I got to see him again when. Um, when I when I beat Peter Shorten's record, he came to that game and I met up with him and he told me afterwards, he goes, oh, I actually just lied to you because I didn't want you to think it was your fault. Oh. So, yeah, really <laughs> nice, you know, it's like, wow. Okay, Give him a big shout out. That's lovely, isn't it? That's, and all those parents that are out there initiating sport for young people, you know, it's so important. Oh, 100%. I mean, you know, I've run a grassroots football team. It's so hard. And what he did for... For all of us, um, regardless to whether us went, whether we went on to make it or, or to not, it was just he gave us such a such a bond, such a, an experience to represent. Um, what were we called? Uh, Marion Football Club. That's what we were called. But just the ownership of of playing for that team, uh, you know, going out. He used to he used to give me my kit before. And the other kids used to complain because they all thought I was a boy, so they didn't understand why. Oh. <laughs> well, I used to get changed at home, and um, and then when it, we'd go into the changing room, I'd just disappear, and like you just don't, you don't even recognise or think about it. So I'd just go to the toilet, or I'd be outside, or whatever, or he'd come and speak to me. Everyone would get changed, and then I'd suddenly appear when it was time for my little <laughs> free meeting. And when people would complain, he'd, he'd made up excuses for me. They were like, oh, can I take the kit home? And they were like, no. He was like, no, Ray's got to do it because his mum works, and, you know, he needs to get changed quick because he can't. It just just basically lie upon lie. <laughs> <laughs> but you know harmless ones and um fantastic man because he didn't need to do any of that and even when I was told that I couldn't play because the the opposition team said that uh you know they got a girl playing the ref asked me to leave the pitch 
he then when they had the the general meetings um for the league he said it's not fair i've got a girl that is playing she's my best player you know you're telling me that she can't play well what do i do with her where does where does she go and that's how i joined mill hill united because mill hill united said well we have a girls team bring her down come to us um and he okay. said to me, his only regret is that he, he was a massive Chelsea fan. He goes, his only regret is that he didn't take me to Chelsea. <laughs> <laughs> Mill Hill uh, was like more of a community club. We had some fantastic yeah. players. I was there up until until I moved to Arsenal. So from about 10 to 16. Yeah, I, moved to, I think I moved to Arsenal at 16. So, yeah, a long time. Were you on the YTS scheme or you did work as well at, at Arsenal? Yeah, so, so basically... Both were separate, but went at the same time. So when I left school, I didn't really know what I wanted to do and, and, and what I was going to be. And then I, I saw this uh, youth training scheme that Arsenal ran. So you went college and you, you did the um, side of it where you learned how to work in the leisure centre and, and stuff like that. But then you also went out and, and you coached kids. They taught you how to teach kids and you went into schools. So yeah, I joined that scheme. But at the same time, I joined Arsenal Ladies. So they were two separate things. They just happened to be at the same time. Excellent, excellent. And then through that time, you played in the UK and you also played in the US at different times in the seasons. How did that work during your career? Well, uh, we at that point were, were playing the Winter League in, in England so and America play the Summer League. So I just got offered an opportunity. So when we finished our league in, I don't know, what it was it, May or whatever it was, to go and go out straight out to America and, and basically join in their league, play there until until well they finish pretty much in August, and then come back and and play in our league. <laughs> so it was like football all year. When I first went to Montreal, so I joined uh, Laval Dynamite, which is in Montreal. I just finished my Arsenal YTS. A friend of mine was going as well. She used to play for Millwall. It was more of a, just an adventure, you know, a youngster going out to a different country. Yeah, playing football it was a fantastic opportunity so so I went there and then um, obviously back then in, in women's football your registration was to the league and for a season everybody always says I went on loan uh, but I, I can't I mean my registration to Arsenal had finished that was always my thoughts were to, to obviously sign back up but when I were at when I was out there I can't remember how old I was 19 or 20 I got approached by Fulham they were obviously Mohamed Al Fayed had seen the '99 World Cup, um, wanted to make a, a professional team in line with the FA's idea to to make a professional league in three years' time. He basically wanted a head start, and they'd asked me if um, if I wanted to play for them. So I came back on an international camp, and Gary met up with me and spoke to me about it and offered me a contract. And I think at that point it was it was a really hard decision because. One, I loved playing for Arsenal. I'm an Arsenal supporter. It was, you know, the best thing ever to play for Arsenal. But on the flip side of it, I'd finished my YTS. I had no job. I was at that point. I, I was actually signing on. And, and that's, um, it's a crazy thing to do when, when you, you, my mum told me you have to because of, you know, playing stamp duty and whatever you have to, you know, you have to be looking for, for a job and, and stuff like that. So basically I was unemployed and someone's offered me an opportunity to, to be a professional footballer I had to take it um it, it was it was it was still a hard decision but it was like unbelievable dream to go and you know to go and train train every day become a professional footballer it was like wow I spoke with the England manager um, and said you know will this harm me because Fulham were two leagues below Arsenal so everybody's saying it's crazy. You can't do that. A two leagues, two leagues below. I didn't realise yeah, that. Yeah, two wow. leagues below. Um, so one personal circumstances, you, you're thinking, well, you know, you go grow up. You've got to have a job. You've got to, you know, earn money. So for that reason, but also the reason of an opportunity to to become a professional footballer, because at yeah. Arsenal we weren't. We were only training twice a week. I spoke with Hope Powell. She said I pick players on form. It wouldn't go against me. But obviously, I had to be playing well. So, you know, I, I took the risk and uh, I made the move. And had you been capped by then? For England, yeah. Um, I've, made my, I've made my debut for England when I was 17. So I was at Mill Hill United and they... Mill Hill United had, although it's not a well-known team, but they had a lot of players that 
went on to play for for England. You know, Kim Jerry Silva, Natasha Daly, Sarah Reed, who played in goal. There was a lot of players there that actually went on to play at a high level international and went on to play for Arsenal and another high team. So Mill Hill United didn't want me to leave when I was 16. They said that I had the qualities of being a future captain and they, they, they really didn't want me to go. And Arsenal, when the, I spoke to... Vic Akers, who'd obviously seen me and, and asked me to come down and join. But I also spoke to uh, their reserve manager, who was basically tapping me out to play for the third team. Now, they were in the same league or lower than, than Mill Hill United. So it was like, Mill Hill was saying, why would you even go there? So again, I, I suppose I took a bit of a leap of faith because I just thought this is an opportunity. Natasha Daly, who'd played at Mill Hill, She'd had such a different story in going. At this, she went. She left Mill Hill just before me. But when she told me that she went to meet Vic Akers, again, we're both Arsenal fans, uh, she went to one of the boxes at, at Highbury, you know, sat down, had a, you know, her, it was not wine and dine, but you know what I mean? Signed a contract, had photos done. Well, I went into the mez, mezzanine at Arsenal in the, in the ball court and met with the fourth team manager who told me that I'd play for them <laughs> and I still signed. So um, it was very yeah. different. <laughs> I mean, that first season, I played once or twice for the reserves, um, uh, was sub for the first team and then played a game up at, we played Everton and there was an England scout there and obviously I did well and, and that's how I, I, I got scouted. And so just jumping back to Fulham, so what happened in the end with Fulham? It was almost a bit too early for where women's football was at the time. Um, yeah, yeah, I suppose if you, if you look from now, it was, it was too early. But then if you, if you do look at what Mohamed Al-Fayed did and, and what the FA said, well, actually, the FA are too late. <laughs> because <laughs> Mohamed Al-Fayed understood that the FA were going to make a, a, a professional league in three years' time. Like I said before, Fulham were, were in a, uh, two leagues below. So he wanted a head start and he wanted to create this team. With a, He brought in a few um, international players, better quality players, added them to the team that he already had. We did our job. We weren't, we weren't helped in any way in terms of the anyone skipped us up leagues. We had to win uh, those leagues, which we did. I mean, some of the games, it was... We had to do a job, and I think that's what the mindset we got into is that we were here, we have to get promoted, we have to win these games to get the points to get promoted. Because sometimes, I mean, we get off the bus and the other team, they were just like, this is so unfair. You know, they'd reel off names that were coming off the bus, like international names like myself, Kate Chapman, Mary Fuller. And they were just like, you know, how we how can we compete against them? And in a way, I, I agree. And it wasn't it wasn't fair, but we had to do process yeah yeah we had to we had to so um so some of the score lines were huge w- were in a way not enjoyable for, enjoyable for the opposition but not enjoyable for us um but we, we got promoted we did our job we we got to you know the top league where Arsenal were playing and then the FA didn't make a, pro- a professional league so in my eyes yes I think yes Fulham was too early but then also they didn't stick to their, their what they said they were going to do so you know, women's football could be much better, a lot more progressed if if that was the case. But then maybe there were valid reasons. I don't know what happens in you know boardrooms or whether it was the right time. So it's it's not for me to say. I just know how we felt when we heard that that Fulham was no longer going to um, going to continue. I don't think that there was definitely not on my part, and I don't believe from the rest of the team there was resentment to to. Right. Ahmed Al Fayed. Obviously, there was disappointment because you know we'd had three fantastic years, and yeah. he'd gone from you know taking a team of individuals, put them together, made them. I think everyone bar one became an international player. So I think when we look at what we did, you know, you take a group. There was a group of women. <laughs> there wasn't too many arguments. There wasn't. Everybody got on. Everybody gelled together. He made all that work, and then we, we, you know, we went on to to win trebles. I think the sad part of it is that when it ended, a lot of people said, you know what, well, didn't necessarily blame Fulham, but then looked at women's football and said, 
I can't make a career out of this. Um, I need to go and find a proper career and, and, and do a proper job. And a lot of people lost a lot of love for football. I know I definitely struggled. Um, I really struggled at that time because when you've been at the pinnacle, the highest place that you can be of women's football, you're, you're a professional. To then I stayed on at Fulham for another season and I knew halfway through I had to leave, I had to go because our standards of where we'd, um, where we'd taken Fulham Football Club, the new players, and it wasn't their fault, but the new players that were, were coming in were, were living up to the name that we'd, we'd built, but then not living with the standards that we, that we sort of owned. That was, that was a little hard to, to sort of deal with when, when people you know, just didn't, didn't play with the same sort of high standards. And also when you're training, you've gone from training every single day to then training two nights a week. It, it's, it's hard to, to get your head around it. It's really interesting. I didn't know. It's really, really interesting to hear because I didn't know that full, I guess, story as to you hear bits from the outside, don't you, as to the perception that it had. But I, I think a lot of people, because we want to talk, and it's not me being bad, but we want to talk so highly of women's football now and we have moved on so far. We actually forget that was a really important moment and we sort of dismiss it. But but there's a lot of lessons to be learned from that, I, I think. And and also what, what the Fulham women's team did that, that time, we proved that you can take a group of women and make them professional and they can. I mean, a lot of people said, oh, we win because because we're professional, because we're, you know, because we were getting gifted everything. Well, actually, we worked so hard. Uh, the training that we did, I mean, the first season we were training at Motspur Park, the men's training ground. We were in there so much more times than the men. You know, we were in double <laughs> sessions and they, you know, which, which is different because we hadn't had the, the build-up of, for our bodies to, to learn how to be professional in training. And so we needed to learn that. We needed to get the... the that sort of fitness within our bodies. It's like teams coming now from the, the championship that are training part-time and then getting promoted to the WSL and then training full-time. It's so hard because your body is not used to that. So at some point, you're going to get injured, you're going to break down. So you need to really have time to get your body used to training full-time. So I think there was, you know, there was a lot of positives um, to take out of that, but a lot of a lot of things that you have to look back at the people that, that gave up and said, I, I can't do football anymore because mm. they just felt that it's, it can't get any bigger than what we've got. And if you're just going to, you know, take it away and crash it there, then, then kind of what's the point? So where did you go to from Fulham? Again, I, everybody, um, and I know people, <laughs> I know uh, a journalist, Tony Layton, had spoke to him years after. He sort of said, I had the story wrote already that I was going back to Arsenal and I, and I sort of flipped it on everyone and went and joined Birmingham. Um, <laughs> so I don't think anyone was expecting that. And like I said, I was just in a place that I, I wasn't enjoying football. I couldn't see that football would ever get to the place that it is now. I could have quite easily gone back to Arsenal and been happy. But I, I suppose I wanted, I wanted something different. I spoke with the manager at, at Birmingham City uh, Marcus Bignall and he asked me uh, would I come down there and, and, and play for them and um, at first I'm not going to lie I did think that he was joking and, and, and thought why would I want to play for Birmingham and you know they were a team that that fought for the relegation and to stay up and, and to try and do that where I was used to playing for, for Arsenal and Fulham that were fighting on the other end but you know what I just thought this actually might be a good challenge for me and my might actually bring back a little bit of love for football again. So I, I have no regrets on, on joining um, Birmingham City. I met so many great people. I think as a club, it was such a good family club. It was such a good, um, it had such a good sort of atmosphere around it. Marcus as a coach, I think was brilliant. You know, a footballer that was was talking to you as a footballer and, and, and sort of just giving you those little tips there and, you know, I really enjoyed it, uh, but obviously Birmingham in, in their second season, I had signed for them and I was going to stay there, but they they had money troubles and I don't think they were that closely linked with, with the men's club. And um, uh, basically they made the deal, probably knowing that I wouldn't go anywhere else. They made the deal with Arsenal that I went back to Arsenal. So, um, yeah, a lot of people 
don't really know what went on there. And I know a lot of people said a lot of different things, but, um, you know, they, they, met, they made the deal with Arsenal. So I went back and joined Arsenal. And you obviously had a, an incredible, incredible career with Arsenal. So are there any, as you look back now, any real, sta- what's a real standout moment for you from that time with them? Gosh, um, I think 2007, you know, the quadruple, you don't win that. <laughs> um, I think it was an unbelievable season and I don't think, one, I don't think that we got enough credit for it. I, I, I think as well, I don't think we gave ourselves as players enough credit for what we actually did. Uh, when I look back, we had, I think it was, because the Champions, or well, the UEFA Cup final, which is now the Champions League, was a, a two-legged final. So we had the first leg uh, away in Umia, uh, in Sweden, who had Marta, the world's best player. I mean, everybody wrote us off. It was like, it was basically, they just spoke about Umia and, and oh, what's that other team called? You know, <laughs> it, was, uh, it was, I don't want to say you want to laugh at it, but it was just like, they, no one gave us any credit for actually getting that far and being in that final. At that point, we obviously got to that final and, and Kelly had got sent off in the semi-final, so was missing it. Faye uh, was injured, so was never going to start, was never in a position that she could play 90 minutes. So then people, I suppose, in our own country were writing us off because we're missing our players, our, our arguably our best players. And I think that gave a little bit more of a drive, an anger to the players that were playing that, you know, hold on a minute, we, we, we can... You know, we can we can be as good. We can put some effort in, and and you know, we can do us proud. Also, Jane Ludlow was the captain. Jane Ludlow, obviously Welsh and very fiery. Her, her pre-game talk was just so powerful. You know, she spoke about <laughs> again, like I say, with her being Welsh. She'd say, you know, you English. Uh, you know, you're so fortunate. You 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 will get to go to to a World Cup and to a Euro. And you'll get to play on the big stage, but I won't. This is my biggest stage. This is what it means to me. And really gave so much emotion in, in the way that she was spoken, speaking and, and said how much of a disrespect they showed us in terms of they didn't even acknowledge that they, you know, her and, 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 and obviously Vic were at the press conference, didn't even acknowledge Arsenal, just spoke about Marta and what they were going to do when they won this tie and what it would be like to go back to London and win there. And she was just like, wow, it was like we had to calm it down a bit. <laughs> so, you know, it was, it was, you know, fantastic to, to hear the passion. And then you think, do you know what? Yes, one, I want to win because we wanted to win anyway. We knew it was always going to be hard, but now I want to win even more for you. I know that I felt like that. I know other people have, have sort of spoke. I've got photos from, from before the game. There was a car parked in the middle of the pitch. Um, obviously, some sponsorship. We were sitting in the car having photos. That's how chilled out we were before. You know, it's a final of a, of a you know European final. We were just chilled out. We were relaxed and we had nothing to lose because no one gave us a chance. So really, whatever we did was was a bonus. I remember myself and Emma Byrne telling Alex Scott, you know, oh, the car's there because first goal scorer wins the car. Um, <laughs> you know, just a, a flippant remark and, you know, left it at that. Then obviously we, we, we held on for, you know, periods of the game. They, they, were, they were really good and, and, you know, we played out of our skins and played a different style of football to, to what was normal to Arsenal. We didn't have all the possession. And then just towards the end, Alex takes a shot and it goes in the back of the net. We were all celebrating. And then after the game, me and Emma looked at each other because Alex was saying, how am I going to get the car home? <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, oh gosh, let's get out of here quick. I don't want to tell her it was a joke. So, um, yeah. <laughs> so it was, um, you know, a fantastic, fantastic day. But obviously then it quick, quickly kicked in that, you know, we've got it all to do again. Um, because we have to go home and, and, and play them, you know, in a week or two weeks' time, whatever it was. Then was a more serious and pressurised game because we had something to lose. That we held on for dear life. And uh, Emma Byrne made one of the best saves of you know ever seen. You know, hitting it, and, and we knew Lady Luck was on our side because she saved it, hit the post, it came back, hit her head, and then she caught it <laughs> before it went in. And at that point. 
I think most of us were like, it's our day, we're going to win the cup. You know, thankfully we, we did. Can I move back on then to your a bit more about your England career and your England mm-hmm. pathway? Despite being you're one of the first to receive a, a contract through the FA in 2009, but then I think there was a, a bit of a time when you weren't selected after this, when I think Hope Power said she thought you'd lost form. So what was happening for you personally at that time? Um, yeah, to be honest, you're probably the only person that's ever asked me. Um, I think there was 2009 was when I got dropped for England. I was on probably about <laughs> probably about 90 caps and got dropped for the Euros. And it was a weird one because the build-up, I think, within training sessions and weeks away with England, you can kind of, without, usually they don't tell you the team, but you can kind of guess what the team is. Um, and each time we go away, I just felt that I wasn't part of it. I wasn't getting a, an opportunity and being in the team. But, um, you know, I suppose that's sometimes you know, you need to give other people an opportunity. And I know a lot of players said, oh, no, don't worry. It's just other people are getting an opportunity. You know, you'll be fine and um, and stuff like that. So personal life, I was, I was struggling a bit with, with a few things. But football-wise, it was it's strange because although Hope said all those things, I don't personally believe it to be true because the obviously we were, we were going into a tournament so the pre our pre-season that time and all the training I, I was training at a really high level and I, I felt I probably felt the fittest I'd ever felt I think for me and this is the way I'm looking at it and I can't speak for hope but I think at a point where um, we were away at camp we were I remember we were doing a bleep test and <laughs> I think, well, in a woman's body, it was my time of the month and yeah, yeah. how you feel. And sometimes you just, your legs, everything doesn't want to work. You don't want to get out of bed. And I was just like, and I felt low as well, personally, what was going on in my life. And I just was struggling a little bit. And I remember running the bleep test. Me personally, I ran the bleep test to how I believe it should be run is that you, when the beeps go, you stop and then you start again. A lot of people, in, I won't name names, but they carried on running. When you carry on running, you've got the momentum. So I believe I ran it right. And I know other people said to me afterwards, you ran it right. But I didn't get a great score. So I didn't do well at that. And I remember looking and thinking, she's not going to pick me. Although, yeah, it was a shock and I was disappointed. I kind of wasn't shocked because I just thought you can feel, you can you can have that sort of feeling within you. But I, I think that I was playing when I was given the opportunity, obviously, when we, when the season season started with Arsenal, at the end of that season, I ended up being voted player of the season. So it's not something you can just switch on and off. So it wasn't a surprise to me that I had a fantastic season because I knew how hard I worked um, and I knew how fit I felt. Just mentally, um, I didn't feel strong. And, you know, that's another point that when I think that in team environments, managers, coaches, team members can all do better and psychologists can all do better because people had had staff members talk to me and, and sort of say, oh, you don't look yourself, but no one actually helped me. Yeah. At that point, I'm not a sort of person that w- is going to go and, you know, shout out everything. I, I, I'll just deal with it. Yeah. And maybe that's wrong for me. But, um, you know, I remember, and that's why... I will always um, respect Kaz Carney and know that she was always going to be a really, really good uh, psychologist because out of all those players and all those people, she knew that there was a real problem with me and she didn't give up. I couldn't speak to somebody that was, now I don't even know how how young she is compared to me, but uh, I knew that I was, you know, her idol growing up and it's not for me to, to go and, pour out my problems just to a kid so that was something that I chose not to do but I always knew that uh, she had my back and she she was there and she could see that there was something else going on which which other people that to be honest it was probably their job to they didn't see that so it's really interesting I suppose being more of the one of the recognizable players it was difficult because I remember when the team had been picked and, and obviously Hope's comments about me had come out in the press. Uh, I remember walking to the dentist and um, there were some workmen. They said, oh, I know you. You're that girl that um, you, you got dropped from England. And I can't imagine that this happens to, to loads and loads of people because I was, 
you know, quite recognisable. In, in, um, at that time, obviously, women's football wasn't as big as it is now. So I think this will happen more often. But I remember him saying, um, oh, what is it? What did you, like, the coach didn't pick you. What is it you went and did? You go out drinking, did you get caught doing it? And I was like, no, I did absolutely nothing. And that, to me, was probably the hardest thing because words that were said about me led to perception of the outside world. And I suppose that's an everyday occurrence for the men's football players, but it isn't, and it wasn't for women. So to feel that and, and understand what the guys go through there's there's no wonder that, you know, there's so many footballers that probably struggle, that do struggle when, when they leave and, and when things are said about them. And obviously with social media now and, and stuff like that, that it's, it's so difficult when you're thinking, I've got to tell this guy, you're totally wrong. You know, I, I've done apps. I wasn't out drinking. I wish I was out drinking and partying. <laughs> <laughs> All I was doing was training. But, you know, it, at the end of the day, I, when I spoke to Hope, I, I said, I... You know, I was disappointed at the words that she said about me. I was disappointed that I wasn't picked, but her job as manager was to pick a team that she thought could win. I wasn't involved. I wish they the best of luck. I wish the team the best of luck. And, you know, I was gutted, you know, when they when they lost. But also, and I know this sounds selfish, but I was happy because, you know, I've been there for that long that I thought I don't want them to win when I'm not there. And I know that sounds really, really bad because it's it's... It's hard. You want people to do well, but then you're not involved. You, you, you kind of don't want that as well. So, And how did you stay motivated during that time? Because obviously you then got back in the team and you, you know, hit amazing records for the number of caps. So how did you motivate yourself? I, I think um, a lot, of, yeah, a lot of people sort of said, oh, you know, it gave me the kick up the backside that I needed. It didn't, it didn't at all. I, I think the best thing for me was um, the Arsenal manager at that time was Tony Gervais. He'd seen me in preseason. He was like, I just can't. He was like, I don't understand it. He was like, but I'm Scottish and I don't care what England do. <laughs> and, and, and that's why I say it was probably the best thing for me because he took all the emotion out. He said, you know, I credit you as a person because I've had, obviously Arsenal had quite a lot of internationals, uh, England internationals play. And he said, I'd had conversations and other players had said that, I think it was the first day that we got the phone calls telling us that, we were no longer going to be in the squad or we were going to be in the squad it was the first day of pre-season at Arsenal. So um, he said, I had other players tell me, you know, I won't be coming. If I'm not picked, I, I, I need time. I won't come to training. He said, well, I never had that conversation with you, but you turned up, you trained, you don't look any different. You just, you know, you've done your job. And he was like, I credit you as a person for that. Like he, he obviously heard things that were said about me. He's like, I can't understand, but... I see nothing wrong with your fitness. And I think it was exactly what I needed to hear because when you're at a point that people were telling you, you, you know, you haven't given the right application, you haven't, you haven't trained or worked hard enough, you kind of need someone to tell you. Yeah, you're questioning yourself. I'm thinking, oh, my God. I, I felt, like I said, mentally I felt not good, but physically I felt like I was in, in quite a good place. So for him to, to sort of reassure me, um, and he told me, go away, have two weeks off. It's like, do whatever you got to do. Don't come train. And I was like, oh, but I need to train. You know, I'm not. And he was like, you are fit enough. You are fine. He said, go away, do nothing. I don't want you to do anything. And then he goes, just make me one promise. You'll come to, to pre-season training in Germany. We had a pre-season tournament. He goes, you'll come to that and, and you know, you'll play and you'll do well. And I did. I, just, I, I went away. I went and visited my, my friend in America who I hadn't seen for a while. And then I came straight back to, to Germany without doing anything and played and, and felt. And he was like, you're fine. He was like, there's no, there's no problem. I'm not worried. So I think for me, he, he gave me the backing that I needed, but he also gave me the responsibility of go away and go away and be, be you because I trust that you're going to, you're going to, you know, you're healthy. You, you, you're, you're a good person. You, you do the things in the right way. And, and come back and, and play for me. You you do something for me, I do something for you. And it was kind of, I think he got the the kind of, I suppose, loyal side. I wouldn't let him down in that part that he'd shown me that um, that responsibility. And you went on to become uh, England's most cap player. Yeah. 
Thinking back to that day, can you remember how that felt at the time for you? And obviously you mentioned Pete Shelton and you're the old the fantastic guy that got you started there as well. I think for me, like I said, the 100th cap were, was big for me emotionally because of what happened getting dropped and the, the things that people don't see. I know I, 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 I didn't probably react in the way that um, Hope Powell wanted me in terms of she gave me the captaincy, I led out the team. And before the game, she spoke about me and, and stuff like that. And I said, I'm not, I don't really, I don't take praise too well. And it was a little bit embarrassed, you know, when people were talking you up. And also in my head, I haven't made a hundred cap. I haven't played anything. Once at Fulham, there was a young kid that was going to start in a, uh, in a Champions League game and was buzzing about it. Came off the coach just before we, we got to the ground, tripped on the last step and twisted her ankle, was out of the game. So I'll always remember that. So for me, I hadn't made 100 caps because you don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> I know that sounds really bad, but that's the way that I, I kind of thought. So for me, I don't think I reacted with all, all like, yay, that everyone <laughs> wanted me to. I was just focused on let's just play the game. Let's just get it done. And I was the same on, you know, doing beating Peter Shorten's record. I was the same there that I was just let's play the game. Let's get it done. You know, let's let's get a win. And then we celebrate afterwards. And and I always said when, when I finish playing, um, it will always mean more to me, you know, breaking records and, and, and winning trophies. You know, so I was getting personal awards because when you're playing, you're just, you're there to play to win, move on. And especially the, the culture at Arsenal, if I look at 2007, we had so many, we had, we won the quadruple. Every, every game was like a cup final. And the more we won, the more people wanted to beat us. And it was, we won the FA Cup final. We didn't celebrate because we concentrated on the on the next leg of, uh, you know, the, the UEFA Cup or, or whichever way around it was. But that's the mindset. And I suppose that was kind of built in me so that I didn't react how, how people thought I should. And coaching's obviously been such a huge part of your career. Uh, as you say, you've kind of started so young. What is it that you love? What do you enjoy about being a coach? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I learned how to coach when I was, what, 16, uh, going into primary schools. And I love working with the youth. I set up my own coaching company after I left Fulham. I think just working with kids and working with now, obviously, I, I enjoy working with more elite players. But uh, back then, to see a kid that can't kick a ball or has no confidence, to inspire them for an hour to be Lionel Messi or to be the best player in the world, whoever they want to be, to give them that confidence, that that enjoyment, that that place where they can go and express themselves and and make mistakes, and do you know what, it doesn't really matter, and you know, go and have fun. And I think you know, there's loads of kids that I've that I've coached over the years. Some some have gone on to to play at a really high level, but they've all you know, it was just about giving them that that enjoyment. And football can do you can learn so many different life skills out of football. And I think I always get told by some of the schools that I worked at were, were, were difficult schools. And teachers would say, um, you know, this kid is going to be difficult, won't listen. And then they come back and say, oh, how were they? Were they OK? Did they listen? How, how many times did they get in trouble? I said, absolutely, angel. Because I was teaching them football, something that they wanted to learn. And also, I'd demonstrate, I'd show them. I was a way for them to see not only the girls, but the boys as well. Girls can play football. It's okay to have someone that looks different playing football. We're all playing on the same level. It's okay to express yourself. It's okay to get something wrong, to not be good at it, and then to practice and be better. So, um, so yeah, I, I've taken so much enjoyment um, out of coaching. I obviously started off um, and ran a grassroots football team, which is incredibly difficult. And I think anybody that does that is, uh, is an absolute saint because it's so hard and uh, you know there's there's you know many stories that we could we could tell you but it made me play better on a Sunday because I didn't want to walk into the school on a Monday and all the kids tell me I was rubbish <laughs> <laughs> and you've got a children's book out in January how to be a football I've pre-ordered my uh... oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so how different is it that coaching of like primary school age children and then obviously you've done the very early end as well in terms of the WSL. Does it feel really different in the coaching? Um, well, I coached uh, London Bees in the Championship last season. I obviously wanted to finish off my A licence 
and, and, and work with more elite players. And I suppose, yeah, it's different because there you're trying to, you know, you're working on 11 a side. You're trying to make sure that you're, you're giving information to, to everybody within the team, uh, you know, at the same time as your, your roles. Uh, so, for instance, um, you know, a right back bombing on where, where the right winger moves it will impact what the right right back does, where the centre backs move. So you, you're trying to trying to explain to everybody that as a team we all have an impact in what individuals do, um, and the space and stuff like that. So, um, but also, I mean, similar things to working with kids is giving them confidence. I think the biggest thing in football, and I've learned that through my own career, is you know if you can give someone confidence, pretty pretty much the same as um, as Tony gave to me at Arsenal, Tony Bruce. You gave me confidence and belief, then I can produce and I can perform because you know I know that the trust is there. So I think a lot of those skills working with elite players, yeah, you, there's fine details that you're trying to um, trying to educate and tap into. But the, the majority is is that you, you're making them believe that that and giving them the confidence that they can play and express themselves and and go on to to do you know great things. And we're still seeing so few women at their very top level at, at high performance coaching. Uh, do you think that's getting any better than it has been in the past? I think there's visually there's there's more um, that, that we can see. Um, I think probably because companies, clubs, uh, boards, whatever people, I suppose, have a duty to, to. It's being highlighted that we need more diversity. So so that's being put on show. So that will inspire. I think a barrier is that if we look at coaching, coaching badges, they're expensive to get. And if you're going to pay a whole heap of money to, to get your coaching badge with with no prospect of getting a job at the end of it, it's, it doesn't seem like a sensible thing to do. No, I had no idea how much the UA for A licence was as well when I researched this. I was going to say exactly that. You wouldn't do it if you didn't know there was a pathway and a role for you afterwards. Why would you invest? Exactly. Unless unless there's, uh, you know, funding schemes. Obviously, you know, my A licence was, was on, a, on a funding scheme through the FA and PFA for elite um, female players. So if, if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't have done my A licence. No way, because um, it just costs too much to, to, like I say, there's not enough jobs out there. And, it, and, and also it's so difficult to get a job and to get experience because I suppose the threat, people, you know, do you want to let somebody in? And that's why I'm, I was so appreciative to, to Luke, um, who was at London Bees, because, you know, there was plenty of clubs that was like, oh, can I come and just do, finish off my A licence? But... But not many people were willing to, to to sort of have me in there because I suppose there's a threat that you know once I I finish the A lessons that, that I might take their job. And we're beginning to see some more female players now in the NBA and the NFL <clears throat> and also in the WSL too. But do you think there'll be a time when we see more women in the men's pyramid of football? Um, yeah, I don't. I don't really. I don't really see why not. I mean, for me, I always relate it back to. to kind of being a teacher I mean you do the same awards and the same badges so why because I get it if you, if I'm playing if I'm a player there's physical difference differences between a woman's body and a man's body I, I agree that women and, and men should not play in the same pitch unless it's for fun because there is those differences so you need a women's league you need a men's league but if I'm a coach then it's all about one how I treat people and how I can put my message across how I you know how I can coach and, and and educate people that has nothing to do with with anything physical so whether you're a man or a woman I don't think it really matters I mean it's there's no a license for women and a license for men it's the same thing or a pro license and it's the same thing in teaching you know we wouldn't go into you know a parent dropping your child off and go oh I'm not having that woman teach my my child would you I mean so I think it's the same. We've got to look at it in football. You know, the coach, if they've got the qualifications and they've got the, the personal skills and people skills to, to develop people, then, then they would be good enough. But I think the biggest barrier will be the media and will be the outside influences that have a big action on our perception of what, what is right and what is wrong. That would be the hardest thing. I mean, you see... 
managers now that get crucified for 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 having a loss or I mean Gareth Southgate at the moment people are sort of calling for his head for for playing against Denmark and losing that. Imagine if Gareth Southgate was a woman. Imagine if he's black. I mean, these are the these are the problems that I just think that it's it's totally wrong. It, it shouldn't we shouldn't judge people on color of the skin on gender. It should be about you know what they're what they're bringing, what the style. If I I just don't understand it. And you mentioned kind of race and racism there. You experience a within your career a little bit I know you talked about an incident in Spain but was that something sort of prolific throughout your career or when you look back no I wouldn't say I wouldn't say prolific um I think uh, like I said it's just, in the Champions League definitely there was the incident in Spain where you know just I just couldn't understand it to be honest I mean uh, one fan there was it was quite a big stadium I don't know how much uh, Real Vallecano Holds, but I'd say there was at least sort of fifteen thousand there. Um, there was one person, um, you know, sort of making monkey noises, shouting at me, and every time I got the football, and I just, I think I was just more astonished to be honest, because I've, I've I've read about it, I've heard about it, I've heard people talk about it, but I couldn't relate to that. Although you think you can, you, you, you don't ever, you can't ever really relate to it until it actually happens. And then I know um, it's happened previously when we've played Champions League, I'm, I'm trying to think what, what countries it was, but... Uh, More overseas than at home at all. Overseas, overseas. Uh, you know, people have thrown... I remember one, one, one time Dan Carter, uh, Daniel Carter was warming up and th- people were throwing coins at her. Just ridiculous. Yeah, I mean, that's like just so dangerous anyway. But uh, people spitting. It's just, yeah, it's just, you can't you can't believe what, what, what some people do. I mean, in this country, I think... I've had comments. I've had comments from from players which you will put down as as banter, mm-hmm. but then actually it does come down to to, to sort of racial biasness. Uh, uh, I, when I was so when I was coaching in the schools, so if I was doing a soccer school or something like that, I didn't want to give out put my phone number on a on a leaflet, so I, I got another phone. So sometimes I used to carry around two phones, and then um, you know I got a new car. And someone said to me, oh, what, you're a drug dealer now. And that's one of my teammates. And I, I, and you can take that and you can laugh it off. But but you think, well, you know. Why, she wouldn't, why? wouldn't have said that to uh, another player. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And it, But it's a hard one to kind of call up and say, oh, you wouldn't say that to another player. And then obviously people sort of, you know, why are you getting on the defensive? So I, I think the look said it all, my unimpressed look. Uh, and, that, and we left it there because... There's just no need for that. No need for it at all. And are you hopeful after all that's happened this summer, and so much I feel has changed and shifted in people's attitudes, that we might be beginning to see a, a beginning of the end for, for some of that racism within football? Um, I'm, I'm hopeful, but I still think that there's a lot. Um, I think there's a lot of unconscious or, or conscious, however way you want to look at it, ignorance w- within, within us all that needs to be broken down and needs to be, I think those are the things that, that will, will, will really have a barrier and will really stop it from going so far. You know, some of the things that we, we don't want to open up and have conversations, really simple things that we don't, we don't, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of something now, but uh, you know, that we don't want to, we don't want to open up and have an awkward conversation where we, where we possibly, possibly need to, I think we'll stop the, there will be hopefully an end to the outright where I said before that fan, one fan making monkey charts, throwing something, coins being thrown. Hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll get to a place where, well, that will stop or there'll be procedures in place that if that does happen, there will be a procedure to it that it doesn't look at. Uh, so if it happened to me that I'm the bad person within it, um, because I think that's sometimes what it, what it, turns out to be um and there's heavy procedures in place that that we actually come down hard on people because we take it seriously but I think there still needs to be and I think this is for all of us when we hear someone say something like the comment that I just said then I mean there was other it wasn't just me and my mate that were there there were other people but no one said anything it was only me that looked and was like 
you know, just gave an angry look and sort of thought, you know, what? I'm not even going to get started here. I'm just going to walk off. I'm just going to leave it. Was that the right thing to do? I don't know. Possibly not. But how powerful if one of your colleagues, one of your peers had stepped forward and said, that's out of order or called but, it out. But that's what we need to do. Yeah, because yeah. if we're going to change something, then we need not just not just uh, the person, it's the victim or the person it's happened to or, or another black person. We actually need everybody that actually finds that wrong to say, do you know what, that's wrong. Or then the person goes, why is it wrong? I was only... And then you have a conversation, you debate, you find out, oh, I didn't really understand that. You know, then you can then you can argue the points over it uh, and the malice over it. Um, I don't believe that there was any malice in, in, in what was said to me. I just believe that it was a stupid thing to say and, and quite um, ignorant. But nobody stood up. And that's where I think we all need to stand up. If we're going to overcome racism, we all need to stand up. Also, what, what we educate and, and, and teach... I, you know, I was speaking to a friend of mine that works in school and, and said, well, we're talking now about everything about, you know, Black History Month and education. And one, it's great, Black History Month, but if so, it's not great. We shouldn't have a month just dedicated to black people. Um, you know, it should just be an overall. This is, you know, we, we celebrate people for what they are. But why do we not teach the slave trade in school? Because if we want to overcome and understand and educate what's happened to black people then we need to teach it because i'm thinking i we, we did the mummies and we did the romans like i don't know how much i <laughs> that's taken me in life but if we really want to educate people then and i think that is changing there are call i've definitely i've signed some petitions i think there's oh, definitely yeah. calls for changing the curriculum and there are some schools that are beginning i've seen some stuff that's yeah. beginning to change out which is, but you're right that needs to be right from the very ground of society doesn't it you know, we can't, it's, it's bad because on one hand you can't blame people because if people don't know and they ain't educated, then then you need to educate them. Yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so that's that's how I kind of sit on it. Excellent. So you have got, you've got an MBE, an OBE, you were inducted into the National Football Museum and you've got a portrait in the National Portrait Gallery. So what do those honours mean to you and, and your family as well? <laughs> I think, well, first off, you know, the MBE was just a total surprise. Um, the story around that goes that uh, it was sent. So at the time that it was sent out, I was obviously playing for Birmingham, but then made the switch to Arsenal. So the letter was sent to Birmingham. Someone at Birmingham had opened the letter and, uh, and read it and put it in an envelope and, and sent it down to Arsenal. So then when at Arsenal, we used to play pranks on each other. So... Then when it came to me in, in kind of like the, the mail at Arsenal, the fan mail, whatever, um, that came in, I opened it. So it wasn't in an official envelope. And I thought, ah, oh, yeah, good gag. I'm not believing this. So I gave it to uh, my mate to read. And I was like, yeah, is this you? Is this you? And we read a little further and it says, don't tell anyone. And I was like, oops. <laughs> and uh, yeah, myself and Rachel MacArthur, we kept that a very good secret when we realised it was like, <laughs> She was like, no, no, Yank. She was like, uh, no, you've actually been given an award here. You have to take this serious. I was like, oh, I thought you was winding me up. So that was nice. Then, you know, obviously it's not something that you, like I said before, you play football to win. You, you know, if you get to cup finals, you play to win the, the trophy and definitely not something you set out to do to get an MBE. And then to get an OBE, I think, is probably more special to me because that was um, – not only for playing, it was for the coaching, for coaching kids. And that meant a lot to me. And, um, you know, I thoroughly enjoyed uh, working in schools, working uh, with the grassroots team, working with a lot of a lot of kids that, that enjoyed sessions and that I put on. So um, so that probably meant more. But, uh, yeah, I think my mum's just like, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> no, definitely proud. But, um, yeah, it's just a strange one, isn't it? It is. <laughs> Uh, and, and finally, are you obviously dubbed a legend, not just in um, Arsenal's ranks, but within the game itself. So you've clearly got a lot still to give to the game in terms of coaching or whatever else you might be doing. But what would you like your legacy in, in football to be when you look back? What, where would you like to feel you've had the biggest impact? Um, oh, I don't know. Um, I, I always like to play in the way that I felt football should be played and exciting style of football. Um, you know, 
we play because we want to have fun uh, end of the day. And then when you when you play in front of a crowd, for me, I wanted to excite that crowd, and I wanted to, you know, the opposition to boo me and the my fans to to cheer. Yeah, if people thought that you know I was an exciting player, a fun player to watch, I'd be happy with that. But end of the day, people remember you as what they were want to remember you. <laughs> I love talking to Rachel and I'm incredibly grateful to her for so openly sharing some of the challenges she's faced during her extraordinary career. Thanks again to Barclays for their support of The Game Changers and also to Sam Walker, who is our wonderful executive producer. You can find out more about all 49 of The Game Changers at fearlesswomen.co.uk. Previous guests from football have included Steph Horton, Emma Hayes, Kelly Smith and Eni Aluko, so please do have a listen. If you have a moment to give the podcast a rating, it does make a big difference. And if you're enjoying the series, then please do tell your friends and family and colleagues and everyone. Please tell everyone about The Game Changers. You can get in touch with us on social media, on Twitter, Facebook or Instagram at Sue Anstis or at The Game Changers. My guest next week is Gail Newsham, author of Inner League of Their Own and the absolute expert on the remarkable story of the Dick Kerr ladies. It's a fascinating insight into the history of women's football. So subscribe now and you won't miss it. I only ever wanted to play football, but of course we we had no role models. But, you know, I was so dedicated. Honestly, I, I, I absolutely lived, breathed, ate football. The Game Changers. Fearless Women in Sport.